Section 6.5 is about something called rationalizing the denominator. And basically what that is, is that if you have a radical expression where there's a radical in the denominator, it's a way to rewrite it so the denominator does not have a radical in it. That's the thing that you're aiming for. So what we end up doing, um, it depends on if the denominator has one term or two. So if it's got one term, basically what you would do is you try to aim for multiplying the top and bottom by something where when you multiply by the bottom, you would end up with an nth root of a perfect nth power. So then if you have a square root on the bottom, you're aiming for a perfect square underneath the square root. If you have a cube root on the bottom, then you're aiming for a perfect cube underneath the cube root, that sort of thing. So just for a little short example, if we had nine over radical eight and we wanted to rationalize that, um, where then we just want to rewrite it so we don't have a radical in the denominator, then what we want to aim for is we want to multiply the top and bottom by something where when we multiply by the bottom, we get a perfect square under the radical. So you could use um, another radical eight, right? Because then radical eight times radical eight, that's gonna be eight. But um, generally you're a little bit better off using the smallest one that you can. So the smallest one that we could get to from there would be 16, right? Since eight divides 16 and 16 is a perfect square, it's four squared. So if we multiply the top and bottom by radical two, um, then we're going to end up with 9 radical 2 on the top, but then radical 8 times radical 2 is going to be radical 16, and we can say, well, then that's 4. So what you get is an answer. Um, so this is what it looks like rationalized right here, the 9 radical 2 over 4. And if you look at that and say, well, I get that there is no radical in the denominator anymore, but how does that help? Because there's still a radical, right? So now there's a radical on the top instead of on the bottom. Um, if you generally make a habit of rationalizing the denominator, um, it does end up simplifying some other stuff. Like if you have to combine terms, then if all the denominators are rationalized, um, then it makes it easier to see which terms you can combine. Like the, there are advantages to it, even though right now um, it doesn't really look that way, admittedly. Um, but they, they do exist and, and we'll kind of work our way up to them. But um, the other option um, is what if your denominator has two terms? All right, well, if your denominator has two terms, this is where the end of the last section, that last example in 6.4, comes into play. Because there we said if you multiply two conjugates, you get something without a radical in it. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. So if you had, just for example, 2 over the square root of 10 minus 1, if you multiplied the numerator and denominator by the conjugate, so square root of 10 plus 1, so I did it down here, it's, I guess right now it's the last thing on the screen, um, on top you're going to multiply 2 by radical 10 plus 1, and then on the bottom, if you FOIL that, it's going to end up being the difference of squares, since you've got two conjugates, so it would be the square root of 10 squared minus 1 squared. So then on the bottom you're going to get 10 minus 1 since the square root of 10 squared is 10. Um, and then on top about all you can really do is distribute the 2 and say you know that'll be 2 radical 10 plus 2. Um, but yeah you eventually end up with an expression that does not have a radical on the bottom. It just has a 9. So that would be um, a rationalized denominator since um, we don't have a square root down there. Um, and the reason it's called rationalizing is because you end up with a rational number. If you have a radical, um, it's probably not like a square root of a perfect square because you would simplify that. So things like the square root of 2, square root of 3, square root of 5, square root of 6, those are irrational numbers. Right? So when you start off with these, like in the first example where it's 9 over radical 8, at that point, you have an irrational denominator. But the 9 radical 2 over 4, 4 is an integer, but every integer is a rational number, right? So you've got a, a rational denominator now. So that's where the idea comes from. When you get rid of the radical, you're getting rid of that irrational component of your denominator. And so then you're left with something that's rational. Hence, rationalizing the denominator. Okay.
The first example, if we're going to rationalize the denominator of 1 over radical 5, so what we want to aim for is getting a perfect square underneath the radical in the denominator if we multiply by something. And it looks like the best thing we could probably use is just another radical 5, right? Then we'd end up with the square root of 25 and we go, okay, yeah, we can make that work. And that's what we're going to do. So we'd have radical 5 over radical 5. And then if you multiply across, 1 times radical 5 is radical 5. And then radical 5 times radical 5 on the bottom would be radical 25. But then you can say, well, radical 25, that's just 5. So this is the square root of 5 over 5. And that's the answer, right? Because now that 5 in the denominator, that's rational. All right, next. Radical 3 over radical 32. Okay, um, this is one where there's a long way and a short way. Um, and the long way always would work where you could say, well, what if we just multiply the top and bottom by radical 32? You get a 32 on the bottom. You'll have more simplifying to do at the end because there is, I guess, a least perfect square that you could get to a little faster, which is 64, right? 32 times 2 would be 64. And that way you keep the size of the numbers down too. Because um, I think keeping the size of the numbers down, that helps with the simplification, right? If you have some giant number, it's hard to look at it and be like, all right, now what perfect square divides that, right? It's easier when the numbers are kind of small. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply by radical 2 over radical 2 so I can get that radical 64 on the bottom. Because then if I multiply across, I'm going to get radical 6 over radical 64, but that radical 64 is 8. So this is radical 6 over 8, and that's that, right? Square root of 6 doesn't simplify any further. There's no perfect square that divides that. Um, if you do it the other way, since I brought it up, so what happens if you go the other way? So, or, what if you did this? If you had radical 3 over radical 32 times radical 32 over radical 32. This will work. You'll get the square root of 96 on top, and then on the bottom, radical 32 times radical 32. It's 32. But then you have more simplification to do, because then 96 is divisible by a couple of perfect squares. Um, it's divisible by 4, but it's also divisible by 16, and that's the one that's going to help a little bit more here. All right, use the biggest one that we can. So I'm going to write that as the square root of 16 times the square root of 6. That's over 32, but the square root of 16 is 4. So you get 4 radical 6 over 32. But this does simplify since 4 goes into 32 8 times. Or I guess you could see it this way. It's 4 radical 6 over 4 times 8. And then those 4s would cancel and you'd get radical 6 over 8. So you do get the same answer. It's just a little bit longer. Um, so it's advantageous, I guess, to use the smallest perfect square that you could get to. Um, although if you don't see one right away, um, just multiplying by another copy of that square root would work, right? Um, it's just that in this case, we had to simplify a little more on the, on the back end of the problem, so to speak. All right, then number three. All right, the thing that's under the radical is a 5x. All right, I mean, those the 5 and the x, those don't really have any other factors that we could use. So it looks like what we're going to have to do is just multiply by radical 5x over radical 5x. And that's what we're going to do with this. All right. And then if we multiply across 7 times radical 5x would just be 7 radical 5x. And then we're going to have 2 times radical 5x times radical 5x, or 2 times radical 5x squared. But the radical 5x squared is just 5x. So we're going to end up with 7 radical 5x on top, and then on the bottom, 2 times 5x. And so we're going to get 7 radical 5x over 10x. And that's the answer because 7 and 10 don't have any common factors, so we can't simplify it any further. All right. Um, 
let's see, four. Um, things like four, um, I tend to look at a little bit differently. I actually think four is easier if you do it by converting into exponential notation. But that's one of those things where I think that, but I don't know that everybody necessarily thinks that. So I figured with four, it's probably worth it to go both ways. So we've got a cube root of y. And notice it's a cube root this time, not a square root. So what we, what we want is we want to end up, you know, we multiply the top and bottom by some quantity. We want to end up with a cube root of a perfect cube. And I think the easiest one that we could get to would be y cubed under that radical. So, all right. What if we multiplied the top and bottom by the cube root of y squared? Because then y times y squared, you could add the exponents and that would be a y cubed. So that's what we're going to end up with here. So on top, it's going to be 8 times the cube root of y squared. But then on the bottom, that is going to be the cube root of y cubed. But the cube root of y cubed is just y. So this is going to be 8 times the cube root of y squared over y. All right, rationalized denominator. Or the way that I kind of think about this would be, what if you rewrote this as 8 over y to the 1 third? So you use the exponential notation then what I would want to get to is I want to get to basically just an integer power of y, right? I don't want like a one-third, two-thirds, four-thirds. I don't want any of that stuff. I want three-thirds, right? That would be the um, smallest integer power of y we could get to. So then I would say, okay, fine. We're going to multiply by y to the two-thirds over y to the two-thirds, because then when I multiply those two denominators together, I can add the exponents, and one-third plus two-thirds is one, right? So then this will be 8y to the two-thirds over y, right? Because really, and let me write this out to where it's a little more explicit, where if we had y to the one-third plus two-thirds, Right, since we're multiplying, we can add those exponents. But one third plus two thirds is one. So that's eight y to the two thirds over y, which is the same thing that we got up above. <coughs> it's just written in exponential notation right now. But when you take the cube root of y squared, that's the same thing as raising y to the power of two thirds. So either way would work here. Um, I guess whichever one seems like it's easier go with that one. All right, number five is one that I think is a little bit different looking. Yeah. Um, but remember, we're only concerned with making sure that the denominator is rationalized. So I'm going to rewrite this before we do anything else. And I'm going to say, I want to think about this as the cube root of seven over the cube root of nine x squared. Right? We can do that. We can rewrite the root of the quotient as the quotient of the roots. Um, and then we want to get a perfect, um, a perfect cube underneath that root in the denominator. All right, so nine is three squared. So it seems like we'd want a three cubed, right? If, if we're underneath a cube root. All right, well then we should be able to do that. So we're gonna need a three for that and we're gonna need an X so then we multiply x squared by x, we get x cubed, and then that's also a perfect cube. So we're gonna have to multiply by the cube root of 3x over the cube root of 3x. Let's see, so then on top, those are both cube roots, so we could multiply them together and say that's the cube root of 21x. And then on the bottom, we're gonna have the cube root of 27 x cubed, but then I guess if you want to break those up into pieces, you can on the bottom and say that's the cube root of 27 times the cube root of x cubed. And then you could say, oh, well then that's a 3x on the bottom. So cube root of 21x still on top, but then on the bottom, the cube root of 27 is 3, cube root of x cubed is x, 
and there we go. Right, we've got our rationalized denominator. And there's nothing we can do to simplify that, right? There's no, no perfect cube divides 21, so that's it, we're done. Um, all right, number six, let's see. What I would advocate first with number six, because there are a couple of different ways that you could look at. You could say, well, what if um, you just wanted to multiply 28 by something to get it up to where um, you get a perfect square? Um, you can do that, although you'd end up having to multiply 28 by seven, um, and that would work. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the way that you want to go. Um, what I would do with that is simplify that root first. Then that'll keep the number small. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to simplify that and say, wait a minute. There's a perfect square that divides 28, which is 4. There's also a perfect square that divides x cubed, which is x squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite that denominator as the square root of... So I'm going to write the 28 is 4 times 7. I'm going to write the x cubed is x squared times x. Right, because the x squared is a perfect square. So then if I rewrite the denominator um, at least a little bit where I pull the perfect squares out and say this is the square root of 4 times the square root of x squared and then times the square root of everything that's left over, which is 7x then what we're gonna end up with is seven over two x times the square root of seven x, right? And then to rationalize that, we could just multiply the top and bottom by the square root of seven x. And that's what we're gonna do. So this will be equal to seven over two x radical seven x times radical 7x over radical 7x. And okay, well then that's going to be a 7 radical 7x on top. And then on the bottom, you get 2x <clears throat> times well, radical 7x times another radical 7x or radical 7x squared. But the radical 7x squared is just going to be 7x. So we'll have 7 radical 7x over 2x times 7x. Um, and let's see. I guess you could either cancel now or do it later. I'll, I'll do it as its own step at the end. If you have 7 radical 7x over 14x squared, there is one last step that you could do because you could factor a 7 out of the numerator and denominator at this point. And you could say, well, all right, then this will be 7 radical 7x over 7 times 2x squared. And then those 7s are going to cancel, and you'd get radical 7x over 2x squared. All right, that one was kind of long and drawn out, um, but they happen, right? You're going to get those, so those 7s are canceling out. All right. <clears throat> But I think that's the way to go with something where if you look at the root and you go, wait a minute, part of that root could be simplified right now. Um, I think you want to do it just because that'll keep the numbers small. Um, if you don't do that, here I guess you could um, multiply the top and bottom by the square root of 7x, which is what we ended up doing anyway, except then underneath the radical you'd have 196. Is that right? I think. Um, I think it's one. Hmm. Let's see. So I think so. Um, you'll get a big number, and then you'd have an x to the fourth. And I guess you could say, okay, fine. The square root of x to the fourth is x squared, um, and you'd end up in the right spot. Although you'd have bigger numbers to deal with. All right, number seven. All right, so number seven has a fourth root. So with all of the things underneath the radical, all the factors of that product, we've got to work up to getting a perfect power of four, right? So that two, we're gonna need some extra twos. 
Um, that A squared, we got to have some extra A's, and we're going to need an extra B. So, all right, I'm just going to rewrite this so it's a little bit bigger. So 10 over the fourth root of 2A squared B cubed. All right, so if we wanted a 2 to the fourth underneath the radical, we're going to need a 2 to the third, right? Because then you could add the exponents, and 1 plus 3 is 4. So it looks like what we're going to need would be the fourth root of, well, 2 to the third, which is 8. Um, and then since the powers of A and B in the original expression are less than 4, then that's the perfect power of 4 that we're going up to. So we're going to need an a squared, and then we're going to need a b, a b to the first, right? Because then a squared times a squared be a to the fourth, because you can add the exponents, b cubed times b is b to the fourth. All right. So then the same thing on the top, fourth root of 8a squared b. All right. So then I guess on top there's not a whole lot we can do. It's just 10 times the fourth root of... 8a squared b, but then on the bottom, we're going to have the fourth root of 16a to the fourth, b to the fourth. All right, well, that goes a long way because all of those factors of that product in the denominator now, they're all perfect powers of 4. So I guess rewriting just with the same numerator. And then for the denominator, the fourth root of 16 is 2. Fourth root of a to the fourth is a. Fourth root of b to the fourth is b. We're almost done. The only thing is that 10 divide or 10 is divisible by 2, right? So we could say, well, then we'll have 2 times 5 times the fourth root of 8a squared b over 2ab, and the 2s are going to cancel, so you get 5 times the fourth root of 8a squared b over ab. And there's our answer. All right, so it was a fourth root this time, which means that when we multiplied the numerator and denominator by some quantity, we want that quantity to be the thing that will result in us just getting a bunch of perfect powers of 4. Right? So 2 times 2 cubed, which is 8, that'll do it. a squared times another a squared, b cubed times a b. So there was a lot of plotting with this one to put together the right thing to multiply by. But I think once you get that, it's not too bad. Right? It simplifies pretty well after that point. Um, well, then what if you have two terms? Right? That's, that's the other part of this like a number eight. That's where you want to use the conjugate. So the conjugate, um, and I guess I'll, I'll do it underneath and just write this in first. Um, so the conjugate of radical seven plus radical two is radical seven minus radical two. So you just interchange the plus and the minus. So if you got a plus, change it to a minus for the conjugate. And if you're starting off the one with the minus, then you change it to a plus. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom by radical 7 minus radical 2. All right, so we're going to have 4 over radical 7 plus radical 2 times radical 7 minus radical 2 over radical 7 minus radical 2. Okay, well then in the numerator, I guess we're just going to end up eventually distributing a 4. And then if we multiply the two denominators, you're going to get a difference of squares. So you're going to get radical 7 squared minus radical 2 squared. Okay, I guess on top you could distribute that 4 and say, well, that's going to be 4 radical 7 minus 4 radical 2. And then on the bottom, square root of 7 square root of 7, square root of 2 square root of 2, so that's 7 minus 2, which is 5, 
right? So 4 radical 7 minus 4 radical 2 over 5. And we can't do anything with that to simplify it because 4 and 5 have no common factors. So, so there we are, right? The, the important thing of this one is multiplying by the conjugate because we've got two terms in the denominator now. Um, and they don't have to both be radicals. Like here they are, right? You got a radical 7, radical 2. But then number 9, they're not. One of them's a radical. Well, I guess at least one of them has to be, right? Because if you had no radicals, then your denominator is already rationalized. Nothing to do. So that's not going to come up, not in this section, right? That's what this whole section's about. You got to have at least one radical. Um, but we can still do it here, right? So with this one, um, the conjugate that you would use, so the conjugate of radical 19 minus 3 is radical 19 plus 3. And if we multiply the top and bottom by that, that'll rationalize our denominator. So we're going to have radical 19 plus 3 over radical 19 minus 3. And then we're going to multiply by radical 19 plus 3 over radical 19 plus 3. Okay, I guess we could foil the top. So we're going to get radical 19 times radical 19. So um, that'll be a radical 19 squared. Then plus 3 radical 19 for the outer, plus another 3 radical 19 for the inner product, and then plus 3 squared, which is 9. And then on the bottom, since we were multiplying conjugates, we would have radical 19 squared minus 3 squared. Um, that 9 looks like a Q. A little better. Okay, so the radical 19 squared, in both cases, that's a 19. So on the top, we're going to have 19 plus, and we can combine those two terms of the radical 19 in them and say that's 6 radical 19 and then plus 9 over 19 minus 9. Okay, so on top, we can combine the two integers, the 19 and the 9, and say that's 28 plus 6 radical 19. And then on the bottom, that's a 10. Okay, the top and bottom do have a common factor because the 28 and the 6 on the top, they're both even, so is 10. So I'm going to factor a 2 out of the numerator, and we'd be left with 14 plus 3 radical 19. And then in the denominator, we're going to have 2 times 5. And then we could cancel out those 2s and say that what we've got is 14 plus 3 radical 19 over 5. And that's it. That's the answer. I guess the one thing to watch out for is um, when you cancel out those twos. Uh, make sure you get both terms in the numerator. It's really easy to do the 28 and the 10 and then forget about that 6 that's multiplied by the radical 19. But um, the best way to do it might just be to see if you can factor anything out. I'm kind of like how I have that 2 factored out. Um, rather than trying to do all the cancellation in one step. So it's slightly longer, but it's way more reliable. So... Um, Maybe then that's the way to go. All right. Um, 10 and 11 are more the same. Um, let's see. I think with... You get something really long is the answer in 11. But we'll get there in a few minutes. So with 10, again, we've got a radical on the bottom. We've got two terms. So use the conjugate. Right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have... 9 radical 2 over radical 13 plus 4. And then this will be multiplied by radical 13 minus 4 over radical 13 minus 4. Okay. Well, then, let's see. I guess on top, it's gonna, just going to end up being 
something that we're going to have to distribute, right? Because it'll be 9 radical 2 times the quantity radical 13 minus 4. And then on the bottom, um, well, we're going to multiply these, but it'll just be the difference of squares like it's been for the past couple. So let's see what happens here. Um, so 9 radical 2 times radical 13, and then minus 9 radical 2 times 4, if you distribute the 9 radical 2. And then on the bottom, um, that'll end up being the difference of squares, so it's going to be the square root of 13 squared minus 4 squared. Okay, so let's see, on top, um, 2 times 13 is 26, so that's 9 radical 26. And then minus, well, 9 times 4 is 36, so that's 36 radical 2. And then on the bottom, square root of 13 squared is 13, and then 4 squared is 16. So that's where we're ending up. Um, so we're going to get, I mean, it's just one little step to simplify that denominator, but what we're going to end up with is 9 radical 26 minus 36 radical 2 over negative 3. All right, so we have a negative this time uh, in the denominator. Well, you could factor a negative three out of the numerator, and then that way you can cancel it with that whole denominator. So if I did that, I'd have negative three. If that's factored out, then it would be multiplied by negative three radical 26 plus 12 radical two. And then I still got the negative three on the bottom. Right, so what's going on in the numerator? Well, if I factor out the negative 3 out of the first term, I would need to multiply that negative 3 by another negative 3 to get that positive 9 back. Then if I factor the negative 3 out of the second term, I'd need to multiply by a 12 to get the negative 36. But then when, once we're at this point, we could cancel those negative 3s. Right, we could say those are gone. And so then it looks like our answer is going to be negative 3 radical 26 plus 12 radical 2. Um, or if you'd rather write it the other way, um, so or 12 radical 2 minus 3 radical 26, that's fine too. Um, I should point something out. So how we got that negative in the denominator, that's avoidable. The way that you avoid it is at the very beginning of the problem, if you flip the order in the denominator. So what I mean by that is what if you took this and said, well, this is the same as nine radical two over four plus radical 13. Oops, I'm thinking about a four and writing a 16. There, so if you do that, then you'd multiply by four minus radical 13 over four minus radical 13, and you'll get a three on the bottom instead of a negative three. Um, and then you'd end up being able to factor a three out of the top as well. And uh, you'll get the same answer. Um, but the way to catch it, like if you would rather not have that negative number on the bottom, um, it's because f the, the reason you get the negative to begin with, it's because four squared is bigger than radical 13 squared, right? Because 16 is bigger than 13. That's what's doing it. So if you just flip the order at the beginning, which you can do, right? It's addition. It's okay if you add in the opposite order. Um, then you're going to end up multiplying by 4 minus radical 13 over 4 minus radical 13. But if 4 is bigger than radical 13, then 4 minus radical 13 is a positive number. And that's how you get around the negative. Here we had it because um, radical 13 minus 4 is negative, right? So we're multiplying by a negative over a negative. And ultimately, that means that when we rationalize, we're getting that negative 3. Um, so sometimes that comes up, but there is a way around it if, if you want to go around it, I guess. Um, let's see, number 11. A lot of radicals in that. And they're not all the same. And let's see, and because there are two of them in the denominator... I think we're going to get something kind of wide as an answer. Like, it's still going to be 
a quotient, but what you end up with in the numerator, I think is going to have four terms. I don't think we'll be able to combine anything. But let's see what happens. We know what we're multiplying by, right? It's the conjugate again. So this will be 3 plus radical 8 over radical 8 plus radical 6 times radical 8 minus radical 6 over radical 8 minus radical 6. All right. Looks like we've got some foiling to do because what we're going to have now is 3 plus radical 8 times radical 8 minus radical 6 in the numerator. And then the denominator, we're going to have radical 8 plus radical 6 times radical 8 minus radical 6. Okay. Well, then if you FOIL on top, so the two first terms, you'd get 3 radical 8. Then minus 3 radical 6 for the outer. Um, then plus radical 8 squared, which is just 8 for the inner. And then for the last, um, I guess it's minus radical 48. And then this will be over. Difference of squares. So radical 8 squared minus radical 6 squared. Okay. Um, there are a couple things in that numerator that we could simplify a little bit because... 4 divides 8, so we could simplify the radical 8. And then 16 divides 48, so we could simplify that radical 48 as well. So I'm going to rewrite that radical 8 as radical 4 times radical 2. Then minus 3 radical 6. Then plus 8. And then minus radical 16 times radical 3. And then, I'm just fixing this because the multiplication looked kind of messy. There we go. Um, and then on the bottom, that's just going to be 8 minus 6, right? So it's going to be 2. So 8 minus 6. All right. So what we're going to get now is we're going to have 3 times 2 radical 2 minus 3 radical 6 plus 8 minus 4 radical 3 all over 2. And I guess I have that first term to simplify a little bit more. Just say that's 6 radical 2. So we'd have 6 radical 2 minus 3 radical 6 plus 8 minus 4 radical 3 all over 2. And then if you look at the numerator, like, is there anything we can do to simplify that? Well, all of those square roots can't be simplified any further, and they're all different, so I guess we're not combining any of them together. Um, but also, there's no common factor between 6, 3, 8, and 4. Because if you're looking at this, if you're like me, you're thinking, I want to cancel out that 2. Unfortunately, you can't. And it's because of the 3 radical 6. Right? Like if that had been a 2 radical 6 or a 4 radical 6, then we could do it. But we've got a term that has an odd coefficient in the numerator, even though the other three are even. we got one that's odd, and that's going to mess it up. So that's actually the final answer. So that's what I meant when I said I think this one ends up being really wide. Um, the numerator's got four terms in it, so that makes it look pretty wide. All right, well, that's everything in rationalizing the denominator. Um, realistically, I think um, if, if you can do the, the single term ones, because in a way those are more difficult just because there's not a template that you can just follow, right? Like at least with the two term ones, you just go conjugate, right? Conjugate the denominator and that'll get you there. You might have to do some simplification, but you'll get there. Um, but then when it's the, the single term, then the way that you work your way up to you know, perfect squares or perfect cubes or perfect powers of four, whatever you need, um, there isn't like one route to get there, right? Like you might have to do different things. So in a way, I think those are tougher. And if you can do those, you can probably do the whole section.